So I've really been enjoying uh, iceberg videos on YouTube lately. That seems to be a bit of a trend, but it's a fun trend to me because I like exploring obscure things. And I got to thinking myself, hey, Old Man Banjo, could you make a iceberg video on RPGs? And I thought, yeah, I'll take all tabletop RPGs, all JRPGs, and all CRPGs, and I'll make a giant iceberg video that's going to be two hours long on all of them. I quickly realized that that is not a video that anyone would want to watch. There are way too many JRPGs and tabletop RPGs out there. I might do separate videos on tabletop RPGs and JRPGs later, but I thought we'd just start with CRPGs segregated off from the rest of them. Before starting the iceberg, I want to say a few things. First of all, uh, one of the things that is inevitable about the way the world and the internet work is that as things get older, and they existed in a time when there was less interwebs, they're also more obscure. So the lower half of the iceberg is going to tilt towards games that existed prior to 1995-ish. The other thing is that I'm not being too strict on what counts as a JRPG. By CRPG, I mean a game designed primarily by Western developers in an attempt to imitate the experience of playing tabletop role-playing games such as Dungeons and & Dragons. And largely what I'm doing there is excluding JRPGs from designers like Hironobu Sakaguchi and Matsuya Yoshida, the guys that made Final Fantasy and Chrono Trigger and things like that. Um, so basically, I'm using CRPG as a designation of exclusion because the Japanese simply have made so many RPGs, many of which are obscure, and will make an interesting tier list in their own right. But enough of a prequel. Let's get on to the tier list. In Tier 1, we have CRPGs that achieved widespread commercial success at their initial launch, often with many, many sequels that were also very commercially successful. These are the normie RPGs. I'm going to call this normie tier. These are the games that even people that might not be into tabletop role-playing or even role-playing games in general will pick up because these were huge blackbuster titles for the PC and if they got console releases, they were also big blockbuster releases there. To absolutely no one's surprise, we start this tier off with Baldur's Gate 3, the highest ranked um, CRPG ever on Steam charts. Probably one of the best selling. I don't know if figures have been released yet, but yeah, we're starting off with Baldur's Gate 3. Baldur's Gate 3 was designed by Larian Studios, uh, directed by Sven Vinke. I think I'm saying his name right. It was released on August 3rd of 2023. It was widely praised by critics and has a Metacritic score of 96%. It would become the best-selling game on both Steam and GOG.com and would go on to have over 537,000 concurrent players. The game was largely praised for the sheer amount of content it had in comparison to rival games and would generate some controversy about developers among, about the uh, realisticness of producing games of this size and scope. Next up on the list, we have Mass Effect. Mass Effect is a game that's going to cause some controversy on this list, and there will be people commenting that, why are you including this on the list? Because it's not really a CRPG. And to that, I make some concession, but I wanted it on the list anyway because I do feel that in terms of the history of RPGs, it's super important. Mass Effect was released on November 20th, 2007, and was directed by former uh, Bioware, not, not former Bioware, currently Bioware director Casey Hudson, who worked both on Knights of the Old Republic as well as Baldur's Gate 2 Shadows of Om. The game was released to almost universal acclaim with a 91 Metacritic score on Xbox and an 89 on PC, Though people did have issues with several aspects of the game, including the game's driving sections, as well as some people who were a bit prudish about the game's portrayal of sexuality. Mass Effect would spawn two sequels, the second one receiving even more critical acclaim, with a Metacritic score of 94, the second game streamlined the uh, experience, made it less, in my opinion, a role-playing game and more of a quasi-shooter, thus why its inclusion on this list is controversial, 
but the characters and overall design of the game were much improved. And the second game continued on the story that became the Mass Effect trilogy. Finally, we get to Mass Effect 3, which we're just not going to talk about. And next up, we have the Dragon Age series. Dragon Age was released in 2009 as the spiritual successor to Baldur's Gate and Neverwinter Nights. It was directed by game director Mark Dara and became an overall critical success across multiple platforms. The game received a 91 Metacritic score with critics praising its world design, comparing it to the likes of George R. R. Martin, J.R.R. R. Tolkien, the game tells the story of a traditional Bioware protagonist that rises up through the ranks to fight evil as the chosen one. You know, the standard stuff. But the game, for me, was one of my favorite CRPGs of all time. The only negatives about the game were that its console versions were nowhere near as good as the PC release. Which is why you should buy a PC. Just joking. The game would spawn two sequels, one in 2011, Dragon Age 2, and another in 2014, but neither would have the same critical acclaim as the initial games, with the game scoring an 82 and 86 Metacritic score, respectively. While the series sort of teetered out after that, the series was still probably one of the most popular CRPG series to ever exist during the uh, mid noughties and now we get to maybe another controversial inclusion on this list. But I think, from my perspective, this is a CRPG. This is Bethesda's Morrowind. Morrowind was released by game director Todd Howard all the way back in 2002. The game was released to a claim that, at least from my little young adult mind at the time, was universal. Its Metacritic scores aren't comparable to the other huge games on this list, but through years of modding, its expansion packs, and Game of the Year edition, along with the length of and length and dedication that the community has to the game, Morrowind would become probably the most famous CRPG. I'm including Morrowind as a CRPG while I would not include Oblivion and Skyrim as CRPGs, given that they start playing less and less like imitations of Dungeons and Dragons. A little bit controversial, but I have to include and exclude games from the list. Morrowind, definitely one of the most famous CRPGs of all time. And now we move on to Tier 2. Let's call this Tier Role Players. These are people that probably do play tabletop RPGs a bit, and they have an interest in CRPGs, albeit they're not huge, massive enthusiasts. We start off this tier with none other than Baldur's Gate. Baldur's Gate was released December 21st, 1998. It was designed by Ray Musica, I never know how to say his name, who is the one of the founding fathers, as we say, of Bioware. It is often considered to be the quintessential CRPG and set standards for how the genre would be portrayed and still is portrayed in many uh, styles and uh, other games for years to come. The game achieved a Metacritic score of 91, with critics largely praising its open world, its descent, uh, its descent, its dedication to D and D, and uh, its overall quality polish and narrative design. The game was incredibly expansive at the time for a PC game spanning over four discs, and it would receive a fifth with a year later with the launch of its um, expansion pack, The Tales of the Sword Coast. It would receive a sequel two years later in September of 21st, where Shadows of Ob would be released. Shadows of Om would continue the story of the original protagonist and child of Baal, as he now <laughs> roamed through the city of Am and its surrounding areas, rather than Baldur's Gate, exploring new territory and taking, critically, the game to new heights, scoring a 95 Metacritic score, which, if you're keeping track, is literally one point behind Baldur's Gate 3, making the two of them the highest-reviewed games on our list so far. The game was praised for its overall story narrative and how it resolved the plot to an extent with its 
expansion pack that came out a year later, Throne of Ball. Much like Mass Effect would come to symbolize the RPGs of the early noughties, Baldur's Gate 2 would come to symbolize the end of a era of CRPGs that were dominant during the 90s and early 2000s. Next up on this list, and some people might say I should put this lower, but I think it's reasonable to put it here. We have Icewind Dale, designed by Fergus Urquhart, Josh Sawyer, Chris Avalone, and other Bioware staff. The game was released on June 29, 2000. The game was radically different than Baldur's Gate 1 and 2, which had more linear story design. While you can roam around in both Baldur's Gate 1 and 2, they were not traditional hack and slash games. Unlike the heavily scripted story-based game that we found in Baldur's Gate 1 and 2, on the other hand, Icewind Dale allowed for a much more traditional hack and slash D&D experience where a player gets to design their own entire party of characters and explore a much more traditional, less computerized uh, D&D world. The game was praised for its art design, its voice acting, containing Jim Cummings, who also was amazing as Minsk in Baldur's Gate 2 and 1. Although the game didn't receive the same Metacritic success as the other games, only achieving an 87 score, it was still very, very popular at the time, and I can still remember the goosebumps from uh, Jim Cummings' uh, narration during the uh, introductions of the game and your arrival at Kaldahar. Overall, the game was a moderate success, but has sort of grown in popularity, and I would think that anyone who's watching this video that's played Baldur's Gate 1 and 2 has probably played Icewind Dale, except you, Oscar. If you watch my videos, I'm going to make you play Icewind Dale. Next up on this list, we have Pathfinder Wrath of the Righteous. Pathfinder Wrath of the Righteous was a sort of rebirth of traditional CRPGs. It was released on September 1st, 2021, developed by Cypriot slash Russian designer Alexander Mishushin. The game used the Pathfinder rule set, which had seen less success in the previous game, Pathfinder Kingmaker. The game was released to moderate success, getting an 8 out of 10 score on IGN and a 83 out of 100 score on Metacritic, which was pretty good for that time, given the fact that this was a retro revival game that began as a Kickstarter. The game was praised for its overall story, but had a lot of clunky mechanics that really dragged reviewers down and are one of the reasons that I've never finished the game and don't really have any intentions to do so in the foreseeable future. But overall, nonetheless, a game that most CRPG enthusiasts have played, and that's why it's in Tier 2. Next up, we have, to no one's surprise in this category, Disco Elysium. Disco Elysium, developed by Estonian novelist and game designer Robert Kurvitz. Kurvitz? Is a non-traditional RPG that sees you taking on the role of a person, or soul, or something, I don't know, placed in the body of an alcoholic detective as you explore a world of politics, intrigue, and stuff. I'm only 10 hours into the game now, if that. I'm, I'm playing through it slowly. The game was released to incredible acclaim and probably what for the developers were shockingly surprising sales. The game was then re-released a few years later as Disco Elysium The Final Cut, which included fully full voice acting, which is incredible. The voice acting in The Final Cut is absolutely incredible. It's amazing the game already had that score before it was even voice acted. Um, yeah, don't really have opinions on this because I haven't beaten it. But the game is incredibly interesting and was a real step forward, and I can say this from my uh, my uh, time playing it so far, that it, it has some of the most unique mechanics that I've ever seen in a CRPG, and it's deserving of its 91 Metacritic score, along with its amazing soundtrack. Now, to the surprise also of absolutely no one, we have the two pre-Bethesda Fallout games. Well, the two main ones. We're not including tactics in this list. Fallout, a post-nuclear role-playing game, was released in 1997, produced by Tim Kaine. I still forget that Tim Kaine made the Fallout game sometimes. Anyways, the game was released to pretty massive critical acclaim, getting an 89 score, though given the game's unique approach 
such a score is to be expected. The game was commercially successful, though it was always overshadowed by what I always see as its big brother, Boulder's Gate 1 and 2. The game would receive a sequel on October 29th, 1998, this time directed by Interplay lead Fergus Urquhart. While this game would receive marginally more critical success than its predecessor, with a much more expanded world, more stories to explore, and no goddamn time limit, it would still be somewhat overshadowed by its Bioware cousin, although they were in the same corporation. The game would then see no further expansions or interest until at the bankruptcy of Interplay, the IP would be sold to a guy by the name of Todd Howard. Next up in Tier 2, we have the Pillars of Eternity games. The Pillars of Eternity games were crowdfunded by Josh Sawyer and Obsidian Entertainment on the Unity engine and raised over four million US dollars. The game, after way exceeding its Kickstarter goals, would release with what I think is a mind-boggling amount of content, well, at least it was before Baldur's Gate 3 released, in March 26, 2015. The game was a moderate critical success with a Metacritic score of 89, which is not bad. People generally receive the game's scope, its beautiful art design, which I feel... These are not reviews. Shut up. I really like the art design better than certain games, <clears throat> Baldur's Gate 3, and I think it was a very beautiful game that uh, critics praised as highly complex and deep and engaging and blah, 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 overall a decent game. It never really hit the heights that one might have expected from developers of this uh, of their credentials, but it was an overall successful game that definitely deserves still to be at tier 2. The game would receive a sequel, also crowdfunded, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I had to Google that. In uh, May 18th of 2018, this game, however, would be not as well received with a Metacritic score of 88. All right, that's the same as the last one. But eh, the game was uh, much more diverse and played much less like a standard CRPG with the players taking on the role of basically pirates sailing across a fictional sea chasing a deity. The game had a very interesting story branching system where basically most of the game was side quests and you could actually get to the end of the game quite quickly. It's a very interesting RPG and one that definitely still belongs in Tier 2, given its fame and popularity, but ultimately is near the end of this tier in terms of obscurity. Next up, we have Knights of the Old Republic 2. Knights of the Old Republic 2 was released on December 6, 2004 as a sequel to the critically acclaimed uh, as a successor to its critically acclaimed predecessor. This time, however, the game would be designed by Chris Avalarn and take a radically new shift on the not just the series, but the Star Wars world itself. The game would be dark, gritty, and have the flavor of a crime noir thriller. The game was released to moderate Metacritic ratings, only getting an 85, which is lower on our list than some of the games we've dealt with. The game would still be critically acclaimed. Initially, there would be lots of complaints about pathfinding bugs, glitches, and that's the reason I never played it when it was released back in the day. I was told it was on launch simply too buggy to play. Whether that was true or not, I don't know. The game's reputation has built up over time, and my subscribers are very fond of telling me that I have to play it over and over and over again, and I will in the future. Overall, though, the game would see the end of the series as a CRPG, with an MMORPG under the same IP being released a few years later, which isn't bad as far as MMORPGs go, but that's a tier list for another time. And finally, now we get to tier three, which I'm going to call friendless, which is a bit insulting, but I don't mean it that way. What I mean is these are games that people will play because they are tabletop RPG fanatics or people that really enjoy tabletop RPGs and they'll play these games because these games offer an opportunity to experience more detailed um, CR, uh, tabletop RPG experiences on a console. They're games that are not obscure necessarily. You can easily find them on Steam, but they're a little bit more for enthusiasts. 
At the start of Tier 3, we have the other game that my subscribers are telling me I really need to finish, Planescape Torment, released by BioWare's division back in 1999 on December 12th. I feel like they used to release more games before Christmas back then. It was designed by, I'm sorry, it was produced by Guido Henkel and designed by Chris Avalon, who we just mentioned um, in regards to Kodor. Like Kodor, the game is dark. It's very dark. It features a man who might be dead, might be alive, I don't know, didn't play far enough in the game to tell, who is accompanied by a talking skull named Mort. The game has a humor style that's very dark, but also has traces of people like um, Adams and uh, Terry Pratchett. Overall, I don't know that much about the game. Need to play it. It was released to incredible success at the time with a Metacritic score of 91, being praised largely for being different than other RPGs. Planescape Torment to this day is probably one of the most unique RPGs that I've ever played, and I've only really played it for a few hours, ignoring times I played it as a kid and just got confused and or scared. The game's atmosphere, its design, and overall unique... Nah, I keep saying uniqueness, but if you've ever played Planescape Torment, that's just the best description for it. It's a very unique game. I'm going to beat it on this channel and make videos about it. Overall, a huge success for Bioware, but something that never got the same mainstream acclaim as a game like Baldur's Gate. Probably because my parents didn't want to buy it for me because that cover... I mean, that cover is just, ugh, scary. Next up, we have what I'm going to call the modern Shadowrun series. I think that's fair. The game... Okay, so, yeah, let's backtrack a bit. The Shadowrun series has had a history uh, as a tabletop RPG for many, many years, designed by Jordan Weissman. The game had a much, much, much less popular NES version, at least in my... I never heard about it when I was around. The game then was kickstarted back in 2023, and released, again, designed by the actual designer of the uh, tabletop RPG itself, Jordan Weissman. The game received uh, somewhat moderate success with a PC score of only 76, but I quite enjoyed the game, and I think a lot of other people did, which is why it's in Tier 3 and not Tier 4. It wasn't overwhelmingly popular, but it also wasn't a complete flop. A lot of people that played CRPGs did play the game. The game... Features, as one would expect, the Shadowrun RPG engine engine rule set. As the player explores a series of events that involve being a Shadowrunner. A cyber hacker criminal in the future in a rule set that's not like cyberpunk, but still sort of reminiscent of it. If you played cyberpunk, it's got, it's got that sort of punky vibe to it. Albeit it has elves. A standalone expansion would be released in February 27, 2014, a year later, that would receive a slightly better critical acclaim, getting up to an 81 Metacritic score, and at this point, I think they really polished off the game. One of the things that I'll always praise Harebrained Schemes, I want to say Harebrained Studios, Harebrained Schemes for, is that they really did uh, commit to fixing up these games. They were very buggy on launch, uh, and they really improved them. This trend would continue with Shadowrun Hong Kong, which I've not played, which was also not designed by Jordan Weissman. The game would be released in 2015 to similar reviews to the previous Dragonfall with an 81 Metacritic score. It wasn't, in my opinion, a game for everyone. I mean, sorry, not this one. I haven't played this one, but I played the other two. It's not a game for everyone. They're more linear than other RPGs, and they're a little bit more combat-centric. But if you're the sort of person that played Deus Ex and you said, hey, why can't Deus Ex be more less first-person shooter and more top-down isometric game, this is sort of like that. In fact, why isn't Deus Ex on this list? I mean, it's first-person. People going to kill me in the comments. Hmm. Next up, we have Pathfinder 1. Not too much to say about Pathfinder 1. Like it's... Uh, brother and sequel in tier two the game was overall a faithful recreation of the pathfinder system on a crpg but it received moderate to very negative reviews resulting in the makers of the game patching it quite a lot to try and make it better i played it and i would rank it as one of the worst crpgs i've ever played i don't like it and a lot of people didn't either so that's all there is to say about that
I mean, not that this is a review, but I just like, there's just not a lot to say about Pathfinder 1. It, it was a thing, it happened. Next up, we have Solastra. If Baldur's Gate 3 is an example of how you can take the 5e rule set and turn your game into a huge success, Solastra is a sort of cautionary tale about Kickstarter games. The Kickstarter was announced in 2019, and the game would almost immediately enter early access in October of 2020. I played it on release day and was actually quite hopeful for the game and uh, have been disappointed so far. I need to go back and check it out, but overall, a game with way too many DLC. I'm so, This is turning into a review. Keep it factual. Keep it factual. The game received a 77 Metacritic score, and to summarize the reviewers, the game felt like having a DM that wanted to murder you. I mean, we've all had the DM that wants to murder you, but Celastra really, really takes the cake. Overall, though, so the graphics weren't amazing. The Unity engine and its implementation felt sloppy, and the game just wasn't overall that big of a success. A game for enthusiasts who really want to explore the 5e engine, enjoy its extra paid DLC and the ability, I think, to create your own adventures. I think it has some feature that they've added now about, uh, yeah, something like that. Next up, we have the Elder Scrolls Daggerfall, which I'm going to claim is a CRPG, in my opinion. Way before old Tatati Howard came to the head of Bethesda, the game was designed by Julian Le Fay, and it was released in September 20th, 1996. The game was met with universal critical acclaim, getting, while well, Metacritic didn't exist back then, it had a lot of scores. Um, it was very, very well praised. Um, uh, for example, PC Gamer UK gave it 90%. The game borrowed from many RPGs, such as the Bard's Tale and Betrayal of Karandar that came before it, but it really advanced this uniquely Bethesda style of RPGs, a style of RPGs that would be radically, radically refined in the follow-up Morrowind. Next up, we have a game that someone is going to tell me actually should have been in Tier 1, and I think if you've been into CRPGs mostly within the past five years. This game actually belongs back up in Normie tier. Kenshi is a strange game. It takes place in an apocalyptic setting. I would describe the game as one part CRPG, one part Door Fortress, and 15,000 divided by the square root of nothing. Crazy. The game is unique. The game is weird. You play a samurai in a post-apocalyptic world. You can radically alter your group. You can build fortresses, like indoor fortress towns. Everything that you could do in an immersive gaming experience, you can do in Kenji. And all of it, no matter what you choose to do, turns out to be weird. The game was designed by Lo-Fi Games with game designer Chris Hunt. I think it's a very, very small team, three or four people. The game was initially released to very, very mediocre reviews, getting a Metacritic score of only 65, sorry, 75. But as time went on, the game developed a very, very large cult following. And with very huge, successful YouTube videos by people like Seth Sinch and many YouTubers covering just the variety of things that you could do that were fun in this game, the game slowly began to gain a, a very, very strong cult following. And so I put it tier three here, which is where it would have been if it, when it was released. But now that it's achieved such a cool following, maybe it's even tier one. It's a, it's a pretty well-known game. It's a tricky one to rate. Check it out if you haven't played it before. Now we have another controversial one. I'm going to include the Gothic series on here because I think, for at least for the first game, there is a real uh, intent to emulate uh, the tabletop role-play experience, at least to an extent. Some might call it a hack and slash game. If you don't think it's a CRPG, just ignore this bit of the video or comment down below. Gothic was released in 2001 of October, if you were in the Europes. The game was criticized heavily for its very unique control scheme. If you've played the game, it has a very strange control scheme. It For, for those of you that haven't played it, imagine Morrowind. Now imagine, like Morrowind, that all of your actual attacks are have a sort of CRPG-style dice roll function. And then just make everything weird. It's like playing Morrowind if you drank two bottles of scotch. 
it's just a somewhat awkward game. Though people did praise it for its storyline, and I do intend to play through it myself at some point. I've messed around in it a bit off and on, especially in the second Gothic game. As I just implied, the game would then go on to get uh, two more sequels. Sorry, two sequels, both of which would be similarly pan for the game's uniqueness. But as far as German RPGs go, the game was unique and still has a very loyal cult fan base to this day. Next up on our list, we have Tyranny. Designed by Obsidian Entertainment and published by Paradox Entertainment, I have previously been criticized on this channel for not knowing who made this, even though I call myself an Obsidian fan. I just forgot that they ever made it, which is sort of a damning critique of the game. The game was released back in November 10th, 2016, and it just didn't garner that much traction. Obsidian had recently released both the Pillars of Eternity games. As a result, the game is largely overshadowed and... Just never really got the recognition that it may have deserved. I would need to put a lot more hours into it to judge that. The game featured a story branching system that also, again, made it maybe less accessible to people, but also, again, another reason why one would need to put quite a lot of hours to explore the game's branching um, roleplay systems in order to really assess it. Overall, definitely a Tier 3. Next up, we have another game my subscribers keep telling me to play, the spiritual successor to Planescape Torment, Torment, Tides of Numenera, Numenera, Numeria, Numenera. The game was released by director Kevin Sanders with developed by Exile Entertainment and came out back in February uh, 28th of uh, 2017. The game didn't garner too much of a critical success with an 81 Metacritic score on PC and much worse scores on consoles. Critics praised the game for its thought-provoking plot and uniqueness, but it didn't achieve the widespread success of other CRPG revivals that were being released around that time, much like this thing of which it is the spiritual successor. Planescape Torment was smothered a little bit by the other RPGs that were successful around its time. Appears to be the same with Torment Tides of Numenera, because I haven't played it, and it's one of the few games on this list that I have never played at all. Definitely a Tier 3, though. And last, but definitely not least in Tier 3, we have Troika Games' Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines. Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines was a very strange game. It was one of the first games to ever be released on the Source engine that wasn't directly developed by Valve, and as such, being made on a very early version of the uh, Source engine, the game is a little bit strange. The game uses the Vampire Masquerade um, RPG system to an extent, in my, in my mind, that makes it a CRPG. The game is overall, in my opinion, if you saw my tier list video, one of the best RPGs to ever be on a computer, and I heavily recommend you take it, uh, to, uh, play it. Uh, the story involves the player newly turned into a vampire being thrust into the drama of the masquerades, and uh, the game really offers a lot of replayability with multiple classes, uh, classes or races of vampire playing in radically different ways. The game has a very loyal fan base with many patches, graphical improvements, and other things that heavily, heavily improve upon the initial horrible buggy release of the game. In my opinion, had this game received a proper final act rather than the rushed ending that it clearly gets, it would have been the, the greatest RPG of all time. But definitely still a tier three because I don't know many people that have played it. Next up, we have a game that should not be in Tier 3, but I think is fair to put in Tier 3, and that is Bioware slash Obsidian Entertainment's Neverwinter Nights. Neverwinter Nights was a strange game. I can still remember seeing it initially on demo discs. Back in the day, game trailers would be released on demo discs if you're young, that they would, they would do it that way. Neverwinter Nights sought to be very different than its predecessor games that were made by Bioware or associated developers. Gone would be the top-down isometric view, instead that would be replaced with a fully 3D view. 
Instead of relying on the traditional party system, although it would have party members, the game would focus much more on multiplayer and modularity. In fact, the game has things called modules. Modules would function much like modules do in tabletop games, where the game would seek to allow players to create their own adventures. The reality, though, is that with 3D graphics at the time being what they were and the Internet being what it was at the time, the game took a massive hit in terms of the overall scope and enjoyment of the single player experience for its multiplayer diversity. However, the game is still played today on many role play servers that have quite a remarkable player base. I have very fond memories playing the game online back when it was a sort of substitute to World of Warcraft, as strange as that may seem. Everyone Tonight's overall was an interesting game, but I feel at this point it's pretty obscure, and I think a lot of people just don't want to remember it at all. Definitely in Tier 3. And now we get into Tier 4, the Grognard games. Grognard is a French word meaning old soldier, which was initially applied to people that liked Napoleon-style wargaming and hated RPGs back in the 60s and 70s, I'm going to say, maybe before that. Either way, this is Grognard tier. These are RPGs that are RPGs for people that love RPGs and nothing else. And starting us off, Underrail. Designed by Stygian Software and Dejan Radisic, Under Rail, were it not for a video by a certain YouTuber named Seth Zinch, would be a very, very obscure CRPG by this point. Under Rail is a CRPG for CRPG fanatics, which is what we'll see in this tier. But the reason it's tier 4 is that, while being a very modern game that's very reasonably priced and very accessible, the game is hardcore for CRPG fans. The game has systems similar to Fallout 1 and 2, but with much less forgiveness. The game is hard as nails, crazy as hell, post-apocalyptic. It features a, well, rails. People live under the world, and they live on rails. It's a similar post-apocalyptic feel to the Fallout series, but it's overall a much more unforgiving experience. It is a CRPG designed for people that enjoy hardcore CRPG experiences. And it's a really great game, and I'm glad Seth made the video and got it more attention, but it definitely belongs in Tier 4 compared to a lot of the games we've spoken about, even though it's the least obscure of our Tier 4 RPGs. Next on our list, we have the Ultima series. The Ultima series were designed by Richard Garriott after the 1979 success of his game Alcabeth with the release of Ultima 1 in 1981. There's so much that could be said about the Ultima games leading up to their 1999 release of Ultima 9, but we're not going to go into that here. Ultimately, the game would be largely replaced in people's memory by the huge success of Ultima Online, one of the very first MMORPGs. A very famous game in its time, but I think if you were to recommend someone a CRPG right now, this would be a pretty obscure recommendation. And I mean all of them, 1 to 9. Next up, we have another Troika Games game, Arcanum. Arcanum was designed by Fallout 1 designer Timothy Kane for Troika Games, published by Sierra Online, and the game would be released on August 21st, 2001. The game featured an interesting moral dichotomy system between magic and technology, and features a plot that a lot of CRPG fanatics that I know still consider to be one of the best today. However, the game received somewhat mixed reviews, with a Metacritic score of 81, and some reviewers liking it a lot more than others. I think it would be fair to say that the game was a bit of a Marmite, for those of you that are British. Marmite is something that British people eat that some people like and other people don't. And uh, Arcana would be a bit like that. I was never as big of a fan uh, of it as I was of other CRPGs of that era, I've been trying to play through it recently, but in its modern form, even with patches, it's a bit clunky. Nonetheless, still feel it belongs in Tier 4, given how few people in modern times have played or even heard of the game. 
Next up, we have another game designed by Tim Kaine, this time also for Troika Games, but this time published by Atari. Temple of the Element of Evil was released in 2003 and received very mm, bad reviews. I mean, not hugely bad, but given the people that were involved, the game received a 71, which was slightly shocking. There was a lot of controversy surrounding the game for reasons we won't get into here, and the game was also incredibly buggy. I've heard, if you want to go back and check it out, that there are multiple fan patches that have heavily improved the game and made it a lot more fun. I remember playing the demo disc way back in the day, and it was um, interesting. Next up, we have the Pools of Radiance series, but here I'm going to be speaking mostly about the only game in this series that I've actually played, The Ruins of the Myth of Draenor. Though I don't remember that actually that title actually being all that important. I remember everyone calling it Pools of Radiance. The game was released on the same engine as Boulder's Gate, which had me super hyped. Sadly, the game did not receive good critical reviews at all. Uh, receiving, and this is before a Metacritic, or at least I can't find a Metacritic score, but it received a 59 from PC Gamer, a 1 star from Computer Gaming World, and overall this was similar to um, Temple of the Element of Evil, largely due to overwhelming amounts of bugs. There are issues involved in, um, or at least people suspect there were issues involved in people that weren't Affinity Engine aficionados trying to use an engine that they themselves did not understand, unlike the people at Bioware that were intimately involved. And uh, most people think that this game ended up being an absolute uh, turd. Um, I'll check it out again, maybe do a video on it in the future. But it's definitely a very obscure RPG, and it's obscure because it was universally decried for being bad. Next up, we have another Tier 4 obscure one. This one made by Interplay and Black Isle Studios. In fact, I believe other than uh, Fall of Vampire, which would never come out, it was one of the last games they would ever make, if not the last game they would ever make. Lionheart Legacy of the Crusader was very different than Bioware's other, sorry, not Bioware, um, uh, Black Isles Studios' other games. It would feature a historical plot involving Joan of Arc, Leonardo da Vinci, Galileo as a player takes on the role of a crusader surrounding the events of the Third Crusade and Richard the Lionheart. The game would, however, release two terrible reviews. Reviews that make our previous mention of Pools of Radiance seem glorious, with a Metacritic score of 57%. The game had a Diablo-style hack-and-slash system, but also was confounded by very convoluted and difficult-to-understand roleplay mechanics, at least according to reviewers. This video is getting really long, so I want to run through two or three other things that are worth mentioning in tier four because tier four is getting crowded we have the wizardry series with wizardry 8 sort of seeing a bit of a renaissance after another video by seth zinch god he comes up a lot in this tier list the wizardry series was a very traditional style of crpg that went on for a long time before its eventual collapse i believe after the release of the eighth game uh, check out seth's video on that if you just type in wizardry seth you'll probably get his video worth checking out Another series similar to that with that first-person traditional CRPG style would be the Eye of the Beholder series. Not much to say about that. Very traditional 80s CRPG that I believe the franchise has more or less died off. I haven't seen anything about it in a while. Another obscure RPG in Tier 4, The Age of Decadence, was a game set in a post-apocalyptic fall of the Roman Empire, released by Iron Tower Studio and director Vince D. Weller. The game came out in October 14th, 2015. The game is so strange and so hardcore for CRPG fans that the Steam page actually contains a warning that the game is not for people who want to be able to do everything with one character or even want games to necessarily be fun, easy, or playable. The game's quite difficult. It is considered reasonably tactically sophisticated and just hard. I never bought it, never played it, 
their warnings scared me off. The game did actually get an 81 Metacritic score, but I fear due to these warnings, the game has been pretty much a um, an obscure RPG. I will check it out one day. If you have played this and have any opinions on it, let me know in the comments. And definitely last but not least, we have the Divine Divinity games. The Divine Divinity games don't need too much of an introduction because we've already talked about the Divinity games. But the Divine Divinity games were hack and slash games that were similar and released around the same time as Baldur's Gate and attempted to fuse, at least according to certain critics, elements of the very popular Diablo games going around at the time with aspects of the type of gameplay being explored by studios like Bioware with their Icewind Dale and Baldur's Gate series. One honorable mention before we end Tier 4 is Spiderweb Software and come to an end of this video. Spiderweb Software make some of the most obscure RP uh, CRPGs out there. Based out of Seattle, Washington and ran by Jeff Vogel, if you know anything about games on Steam and you check out CRPGs on Steam, I'm sure you've seen the Avernum series. Now, I chose to list all of this studio's games in one. While Spiderweb Software have had some success, especially with their Avernum series, they've released multiple games such as Nethergate Resurrection or the Avadin series that are much more obscure, especially the Exile series. Overall, their games are obscure, but they're also very niched down. I say they're a tier 4. And that brings us to the end of our tier list. I hope this video was informative, gave you some new RPGs to look at, I don't know, instructive, entertaining, all those things. But before we leave, I want to give you what I'm going to call the one tier 5 game. And I challenge you to comment down below if you can think of a CRPG that's more obscure than the one that I'm about to mention. Birthright the Gorgon's Alliance was released in 1977, developed by Synergistic Software, who normally make strategy games, and published by Sierra Online. The game was a bizarre mix of tactical, broad scope, turn based strategy on the uh, top down level, similar to uh, games that would come out around the same time, such as Shogun Total War, but the game had a, an adventuring mechanic, which allowed the player to take control of themselves along with several heroes and go and try and acquire magic items that could boost their kingdom or accomplish other feats. This, however, was done in the Doom 2 engine, similar to a game like Hexen, which makes this one of the strangest CRPGs of all time. It is a tactical CRPG from, sorry, it's a tactical game like Total War from the top down, but it plays like a CRPG using the Doom engine once you are uh, in a dungeon, which makes it, in my mind, one of the strangest games I ever picked up in a bargain bin when I was a kid. Maybe not totally a CRPG, but in my mind, it plays like a CRPG for a lot of it, and it's one of the most obscure games I've ever heard of. I have no hope of anyone ever remastering it or getting it to work on modern software well, but I figured I'd throw it out there. And if you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one. Well, this has gotten long. Peace.